Morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ. This is our Saturday morning, uh, Sunday morning, Samuel to Chronicles study. We're in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 16. We're glad that you're here and pray the Lord blesses you for having been here. Uh, remember that we covered 1 Samuel and 1 Samuel dealt with Samuel and dealt with Saul and David. And remember that Saul was the first king. This is the United Kingdom period. And uh, David was appointed king, but Saul didn't want to give up the, the rule. And so Saul finally died at the end of uh, 1 Samuel. And that brought us then to 2 Samuel. And as we looked at 2 Samuel, we noticed that 2 Samuel is again the United Kingdom as David unites everybody together. And as he does that, then David's success is going to increase. And then we're going to notice that David's sin, and then David's trouble starts. Uh, and then we have some uh, stuff at the end of the book that's that's tacked on there that we'll look at when we get there. But we're looking at his reign over Judah, and we notice that he then is started reigning over Israel, the whole thing. And so we're in this section here, and we're in chapter 6 in the middle of, of the chapter. Uh, and we're looking at, at David during that time as we're reading. And remember that uh, Chronicles is also included in here, and that Chronicles deals with the life of David, but we're not going to deal with a lot of Chronicles, because Chronicles uh, sometimes just simply repeats what you have in the book of 2 Samuel. But uh, we noticed that uh, when it came to moving the temple, that that was done in 1 Chronicles chapter uh, 14 and 15 and around there. And so that's what we're dealing with in Chronicles. So as we take a look at that, uh, we're in 2 Samuel. Samuel chapter 6 and verse 16, and we notice that the temple just, the uh, uh, tabernacle just got moved. The ark was brought back into Jerusalem, and you remember Uzzah touched the ark and died, and the reason that that happened is because God had commanded Israel how they were supposed to move the ark, and Israel wasn't listening to them. Israel didn't, didn't uh, heed what God said, but they probably just simply did exactly what the Philistines had done in bringing the ark back when it had been captured by the Philistines. And then finally, when it came back, they remember that they put it on a, on a cart and they had some milking cows take it. And then that cart was brought into, into the area of Judah and it was placed in um, a house for a number of years. And so it hadn't been moved anywhere or nothing has, had happened to it for a number of years. Uh, and so therefore it's probably that they became neglectful of it since it hadn't been moved. And as a result of that, when it was moved, they had all kinds of problems, and uh, Uzzah, God finally struck Uzzah, Uzzah down because of his ir irreverence when he touched it, and I hope you see a bunch of God's grace in there because it took a lot for God to do that. They had sinned in a number of ways even before uh, Uzzah touched the ark, and yet God was, was being merciful to them, but finally it got to where the last straw was broken, you might say, and God then brought about judgment. As a result of that, David then was afraid of God, and as a result of that, they uh, put the ark back in, into uh, a household, uh, Obed-Edom's house, and he was there for three months until finally, according to First Chronicles, we figured out that God, that uh, David had figured out that the way he was supposed to move the ark was by the priests, and certain priests were supposed to move it. It was supposed to be done in a certain way. Uh, and so therefore, when David had that done, then he was able to bring the ark back. And that's what he had in first, second Samuel 16, 6, verse 13, where it says, So it was that when the bearers of the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an, an ox and a fatling. And so the idea is that as it was moving and God was with them and nobody died as a result of touching it, then David sacrificed uh, an offering uh, after six paces. And I, I don't believe that that was something that had to be done every six paces, but it was just simply an acknowledgement that they were uh, moving God's ark the way it wanted to be moved. And so it says, and David was dancing before the Lord. And I'm reading this because it's important for the next section. And David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a, a linen ephod. Uh, so, so David uh, and all the house of Israel were, were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with shouts of triumph. 
And as we, as we looked at that, we noticed that as they were doing that, uh, Chronicles gave us a little bit more information with exactly what David did. And like I said, I'm not going to get into that, but you can look at it in Chronicles chapter 15 is where you find most of that, most of that done. But then we have this section here that's in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 16, uh, the result of what happens when David goes home. Now, if you notice over here in Chronicles, in Chronicles 15, we have the ark being brought up and we have David setting everything up for the ark and the priest and, and how it was supposed to be done. But, but I also want you to notice that it said down here in verse 26 of First Chronicles 15, and because God was helping the Levites who were carrying the ark of the covenant of the Lord, they sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams. And so they did that uh, as they went six paces and they found out that the, that the Lord was blessing them and helping them. Uh, and so it says in verse 27, now David was clothed with a, robe, with a robe of fine linen with all the Levites who were carrying the ark and the singers and the uh, Tenonai, the leaders of the singers, uh, with the singers, David also wore a, uh, an ephod of linen and thus all Israel brought the, uh, up the ark, of, the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouting and uh, with the uh, sound of horn, with trumpets, with loud sounding cymbals, with harps and with lyres. And it happened when the ark of the, of the covenant of the Lord came to the city of David that Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and celebrating, and she despised him in her heart. And so we're going we're to notice that at, uh, we're going to notice that what happens before they actually place the ark in the tent, you might say. Uh, and, and but that simply tells us the reaction that's going to happen, and we're going to notice that that. Uh, in, in chapter 16 of First Chronicles, that you then have the ark placed in the tent, and you have uh, David singing and, and giving thanks for the for the ark being brought up um, there, and then the the worship before the ark uh, that's there, and uh, so I, I want to read a little bit of this because it still has to do with with what's going on as they're moving the ark, even though we had that that statement made in chapter 15 of First First Chronicles. And down here at verse 29, that she despised him. But this is the activity that was going on, uh, that she uh, basically despised him as they're putting the, t the ark back in the, in the tent. And, God, and David is giving them instructions, or David has pointed it out for them. He says in 1 Chronicles 16, And they brought the ark of, the, of God and placed it inside the tent, which David had pits for it. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. He distributed to everyone in Israel, both men and women, to, every, to everyone a, a loaf of bread and a portion of meat and a raisin cake. And he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord, even to celebrate and to thank and, and to thank and praise the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. Uh, Asaph, the chief, and the second to him was uh, Zacharias and Jael and uh, Shemer Ramoth. J Jael, uh, Mattathiah, uh, Eliab, Benai, uh, Obed-Edom, and uh, Jael with musical instruments, harps, lyres. Uh, also, Asaph played loud sounds of cymbals, and Benaiah and Jehazael, the priests, blew trumpets continually before the, the Ark of the Covenant of God. Then on that day, David uh, uh, first assigned Asaph and his relatives to give thanks to the Lord. And so it, it then points out the songs that they sang and the fact that David sang a song and uh, wrote it down here. And, and it, this all happened as David was bringing in the ark before he returned back home. And then you had this worship of, uh, that was done in verse uh, 37. It says, so he left Asaph and his relatives there before the ark of the, of the covenant of the Lord to minister before the ark of God. As, uh, as every day's work required. And Obed-Edom with his 68 relatives, and Obed-Edom also the son of uh, Jew, the Thun, the uh, Hosa, Hosa as gatekeepers. And he left Zadok the priest and his relatives the priest before the tabernacle of the Lord in the high places, uh, which was at uh, Gibeon, to offer burnt offering to the Lord on the altar, burnt, burnt offering continually morning and evening, uh, uh, eve even according to all that is written in the law of the Lord, which he had commanded Israel. Uh, with, them, uh, with them were uh, Heman and uh, Jeduthun, and the rest who were chosen and were des uh, designated or designed 
I'm sorry, designated by name, give thanks to the Lord because his loving kindness is everlasting. And with them were uh, Eman and uh, Jedutha with trumpets and cymbals for, for those who should sound aloud and with musical instruments for the songs of God and the sons of Jutham, uh, Judutham for the gates. Then all the people departed each to his house and David returned and blessed his household. And so we see that David then has all these, these, the organized, you might say, worship of God set up. And they had all these singers and they had all of these uh, uh, instrumental music and, and those kind of things. And one of the things that we understand is that God was not the one who set up those instrumental music and, and the singers and all that. That was something David did. And he did it so that there was rejoicing before the Lord. Uh, and uh, God didn't, didn't reprimand David for doing so. And so I, I think that we need to be careful when uh, some people today uh, have this, this idea that um, instrumental music is something that God didn't authorize. And certainly it's, it's not something that you find in the New Testament, uh, but yet you didn't find it in the Old Testament until David put it in. And uh, you have to assume that David asked God or God allowed him to do that. And and so it was acceptable then, where we don't have any of that in the, in, in the New Testament record of the church doing that, but I just simply wanted to point that out for you. But what I want you to notice here in verse 43 is, and all the people returned and departed each to his house, and David returned to his house. And as David returned uh, to his house, and then we're going to notice what happens over here in, in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 16. And so let's go there. And now that we kind of have all that background again reviewed for us, and we're going to notice here what happens in verse 16. Uh, in in uh, verse 16, it says, Then it happened as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, that Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent with which David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offering and peace offering before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offering and the peace offering, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And for, uh, further, he distributed to all the people, to all the multitudes of Israel, both of, to men and women, a, a cake of bread and one of dates and one of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed each to his house. But when David returned to bless his household, Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel distinguished himself today. He uncovered himself today in the eyes of his, ser of his servants' maids as one of the foolish ones shamefully uncovers himself. So David said this to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me before your father and before and above all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will, uh, I will be more lightly esteemed than this and will be hum, humble uh, in my own eyes. But with the maids of whom you have spoken with them, I will be dis distinguished. Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. And so as you notice here, as, as all that celebrating is, is coming on, there is a, a great deal of excitement going on. And there's a, a great deal of, 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 celebra of celebration that's going on as the, as the Ark of the Covenant is moving back into uh, Jerusalem and is moving back, uh, well, not back into, but is moving into Jerusalem and is going to find its, its resting place uh, as David had built the tabernacle there and had it set up in order to receive the, the ark. And remember that First uh, Chronicles chapter uh, uh, 14 and 15 set up for us exactly what it was that David set up in order for the, for the worship of, the, of God to be performed daily there in the tabernacle as the ark was brought in. So as this ceremony is happening and, and as the sacrifices are, are going on, remember this would be an all day thing. It says that it happened as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, that Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And so 
And one of the things that this shows you is that as is even though that this wasn't what you and I might call a worship service, it was certainly something that was being done in honor of God. And by the way, uh, I don't find any place in the New Testament where it talks about a worship service uh, other than in Romans chapter 12 when it says that it's our reasonable worship of service or service of worship in uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2. And that's talking about our activity, but not just our activity when we meet together. But you might say that this was a time of worship. This was a time when people were, were thinking of God and praising God. And that's really what worship is, uh, when they praise God and they worship him and they, they think about him. Uh, I'm afraid that sometimes we've turned worship into a, um, a, a systematized method of doing something. And if it's not done in exactly the same way, then it's not worship. And so therefore, I can't worship at home or I can't worship anywhere else. I have to come to a church service in order to worship, and that's not what God intended. Matter of fact, that's what God was talking to the woman at the well about in John chapter 4, when Jesus said to the woman at the well, after being asked, you know, you say we worship here, and and we worship in Samaria, and, and so which is it, Jesus? And Jesus says, sir, there's coming a time where you'll neither worship God in this mountain or in any place, uh, but you can worship God wherever you are, for God seeks those to, to worship him who worship him in spirit and in truth. So it's not the place, it's not where we go, it's our recognition of God, whether that happens in our car, whether that happens as we're praying or meditating because of the sun, uh, as we're watching a sunset or we're seeing our children and, and we just praise God and we worship him. And, and certainly there, there are things that God wants us to do uh, as a as a the expression of our of our worship, but that's not the only place that worship is confined to. Is when we when we do those types of things, and if you just do a cursory view of worship in the scriptures, people worship when the 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 uh, a servant of Isaac worshipped when he found Rebecca. Um, Jacob worshipped when he was on his way to to uh, Laban to get his wife, uh, and uh, uh, Abraham worshipped. Uh, when he came back out of Egypt. So there's all, there's this idea of worship isn't something that, that's, that's necessarily organized. And so what I want to suggest to you is there's this worship going on here. And this worship that's going on here, uh, Michael looks out as she sees uh, uh, David, and David in his expression and in his love for God is leaping and dancing before God. Uh, and and uh, she uh, despised him uh, in her heart. Now, having said that, that doesn't take away from those prescribed things that God wants us to do, that we do because we worship him, because we reverence him. But that's not the only thing that, that one might consider as worship. Uh, and so uh, that's what we see here with David. He's leaping and he's dancing before the Lord. And so you can just kind of see as the ark is coming in, David is in front and he's jumping up and down. He's praising God. He's, he's dancing. He's, you know... He's uh, a leaping, he's, he's uh, uh, looking, you might say, kind of um, to a trained eye, maybe foolish even, as, as this is going on. Um, and so it says, and she despised him in her heart. So um, Michael, his, his wife, you remember, Michael was the, was the daughter of Saul, who had been taken from him after Saul had promised to give Michael to, to David for 200 foreskins or 100 foreskins, and then Saul gave Michael to another individual. And so before the unification of the country came about, David had asked uh, Joab to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Abner, had asked Abner to, to uh, get Michael and bring her back to him. And so um, when he did that, then Michael then became David's wife again, and, and that's who we see here. Now, remember that David had other wives at this time. Michael wasn't the only wife that he had, but she's the one that is, is doing this here uh, as David comes in to bless his house. So David is coming in for the purpose of blessing his house, and you might see this as David goes in. You know, he blesses each of his wives and his family and his kids, uh, and then Michael makes this statement. Now, Michael was the daughter of Saul. And if you remember what kind of a king Saul was, Saul was a king who 
uh, you might say, was more concerned about how he looked to the people and how the people looked at him than he was about doing what God said. And so she's, she's concerned about, you might say, it, uh, David's reputation among the elite royalty or nobility. And as she, the daughter of a nobleman, the, the daughter who was used to being referred to as, you know, uh, a queen or as one of the queens, you know, Saul's daughter during the time that Saul was there, she would be considered a princess uh, and therefore she would be acting as a, like a princess. And it says, and she looked out the window and she saw King David leaping and dancing before God. She despised him in her heart. Now, one of the things that we, we you have to understand is the reason that God wants us to guard our heart is because what's ever in your heart is going to come out. Whatever you put in your heart is going to come out. It, it, will, it will leak out. I don't care what you put in your heart, whether it's bitterness, revenge, hatred, it's going to come out. Uh, and Jesus even said that. He said, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders. And he goes through and he talks about the things that proceed out of the heart. And that's why God wants our heart. He doesn't just want our, the outside. He wants our heart. He wants us to keep our hearts clear, clean and pure, uh, as opposed to having hearts that, that uh, aren't clean and pure. And so she, she despised him in her heart. And as a result of that, uh, notice what happens then in verse 17. It says, so they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent, which David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And so the idea of burnt offerings is, of course, the idea of uh, if they had done anything wrong, that God would forgive them. Burnt offerings were for the purpose of forgiveness. After having offered the burnt offerings, then they offered peace offerings. And peace offerings is sharing a meal with God because you are in a right relationship with him. And that's the order in which the offerings need to be made. If you're, out of, if you're out of sorts with God, you don't have a peace offering first. You have an offering that, that is necessary for you to get right with God. After you're right with God, then you can have a peace offering. So if you're in sin and you're not doing what's right in our day and time and you're a Christian, then you need to ask God to forgive you. And after ask, asking God to forgive you, then having restored that fellowship with God, uh, we can offer to God those offerings that we might offer because we are at peace with him, because we have peace with him. And therefore we offer those things. Now, if you're not a Christian, you can't just come to God and say, God, I'm gonna give you stuff, I'm gonna offer stuff to you so we can have a peace offering. No, you have to come and offer to God what God requires. And what God required in, in the burnt offering was the total burning up of a sacrifice that was necessary for, for you to pay for your sins. In our day and time, that sacrifice would be Jesus. And so you have to accept Jesus. And one of the ways that you knew you accepted Jesus was when you were baptized in his name in order to have your sins forgiven, which I'm pretty sure is part of what's under consideration when Jesus told Nicodemus, you have to be born again. Even though Nicodemus was a, what you and I might call a, a, a good Jewish ruler and leader, uh, that wasn't going to be enough in order for him to have a right relationship with God. It was going to take that burnt offering of Jesus that he would have to accept by accepting Jesus in the watery grave of baptism. Having done that, then you could have fellowship with God, and then you could have burnt offerings. So I want you to notice that here, that that's, that's what happened when they brought in the ark uh, in order for, for that to happen. Uh, and so that's the order we need to understand. That's also what was going on in uh, the offering with Cain and Abel. Uh, Abel was bringing an offering that would make him acceptable to God, and Cain was just bringing a peace offering, you might say. And that's the reason why God didn't accept Cain's peace offering, uh, because it wasn't offered appropriately or properly uh, after a proper burnt offering that would uh, indicate the death of someone uh, that made it possible for that fellowship to be restored. All right, now it says in verse 18, when, when David had finished offering the burnt offering and the peace offering, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. Now, there's no other way in which we can be blessed except in the name of the Lord. That's the only way, that's the only way we can be blessed. Uh, in in uh, uh, Genesis 14, verse 19, it says, he blessed him and said, 
Blessed be Abraham, Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And so God is the one who blesses us. God is the one who, who gives us everything, everything that we need. Uh, and and uh, in Exodus 39 and verse 43, it says, And Moses examined all the work, and behold, they, they had done it just as the Lord had commanded. Uh, this they, they had done, and so Moses blessed them. And of course, Moses blessing them in the name of the Lord. And so he blessed them in, in the name of the Lord in order to bring about God's, God's blessing on them. Because that's what we need in order to be blessed. We, we need to be in a right relationship with God. And once you're in that right relationship with God, then God will start to bless you. Now, 2 Samuel 6 and verse 19, it says, Further, he distributed to all the people, to all the multitude of Israel, both, both men and women, uh, a cake of bread and one of dates and one of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed to his own house. So this idea of, of David giving them something to eat with the idea of God, of David sharing a meal with them. They, they were all in, in, a, in agreement with bringing in the ark. So, so they, were, they were sharing this meal. They were sharing bread together. Uh, and that's one of the things that God's people do together is we get to eat together and, and we share meals with one another because we are in agreement with each other and we have this fellowship uh, with each other. Uh, and in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 3, it says he distributed to every, every one of Israel, both men and women, to everyone a loaf of bread and a portion of meat and a raisin cake. And so uh, it points out that, that David was blessing the people by providing food for them and giving them food. And that's, what, that's how God provides for us. And you remember when Jesus uh, fed the people? He fed the people because that indicates he's providing for them. He's giving them what they need in order for them to live. And that's, that's what's going on here, that as God has been brought into Jerusalem, David is providing for the people uh, what, is going, what, what is going to be necessary for them to live. But of course, David does it in a physical way. God is going to do it in that spiritual way. And then it says, then all the people departed each to his own house. So that they, they each went home. Uh, and I think that's interesting. They didn't stay there by the ark and, and uh, every day spend time by the ark. That, that's not the way God dealt with Israel. There was a certain class of people that spent uh, every day with God. But even, the, even they, if you notice, the Levites I'm talking about, they were scattered throughout the nation of Israel. Uh, God can be everywhere and anywhere at the same time. And so Israel doesn't have to come to the temple in order to worship God on a daily, in a daily manner. Now, they could if they lived close by. Certainly they could. But that wasn't something God required of them. God did require them as a nation to come three, you know, uh, to come three different times uh, in order uh, for special occasions. But generally, Israel could worship at, at home and and. Uh, the, the ark represented God in their country and God with them. And so if God is with us, we don't have to come to church to worship, although we do come to church to encourage one another and to do certain things together that uh, we really can't do as well as at home, uh, but we do, it, we do it together as a means of encouraging one another. But worship to God is something that we're, we're supposed to do at home. At home is where we worship to God. So even though they brought the Ark of the Covenant in, uh, each man departed to his house, now being in a right relationship with God as far as the nation is concerned, and they could worship God there uh, as well. And so I, I find that interesting. Now verse 20 says, But when David returned to bless his household, Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel distinguished himself today he uncovered himself today in the eyes of his servant, of his servant's maids, as one of the foolish ones shamefully uncovers himself. Now, I want you to notice what Michael said. Well, first of all, notice that David comes home in an attitude to bless his house. The Ark of the Covenant had just been brought into Jerusalem, had just been restored to its place in the, in the tabernacle. They had renewed their relationship with God as a nation. They had offered sacrifice and peace offerings. Everything should have been at peace and have tranquility with one another. But rather than that, 
my kale wasn't overly concerned about her about the spiritual welfare of her house. She was concerned about how people saw her husband. That's what she was concerned about. How did people see my husband? And, and why was that important to her? Because she was more concerned about the physical things than she was about the spiritual things. She was more concerned about how do people see my husband and look. Uh, he, he looks like all the common people. He, and I would take it by this, when she said he uncovered himself today in, in the eyes of his servants, maidens, uh, as one of the foolish ones shamelessly would uncover himself, it's not talking about the idea that David got naked and, P and people saw him naked. It's, it's the idea that, that David took off his royal clothing and they saw David as just one of the common people. They saw David as one as just one of the, one of the individuals. And not only that, uh, but she said he was also acting foolishly, it says. Uh, and it says, the maids as one of the foolish ones shamefully uncovers himself. And so she was, she was upset with the fact that David's reputation wasn't being upheld instead of the fact that David had brought in the Ark of the Covenant, that their relationship with God was, was whole, that they had restored that relationship, which for a number of years had not been perfectly balanced, you might say, or perfectly executed, but now they had the opportunity to, for that. And rather than that, she's more concerned about the physical things. And certainly that reminds us of the story of Martha and Mary, where Jesus had come into Martha and Mary's house, Lazarus's house, house, and they were going to have dinner. And uh, Martha was uh, concerned about serving, and so she was getting everything ready for dinner, while while Mary was was uh, at the feet of Jesus, listening to him speak. And so, as Martha was getting a, a little, you know, frustrated because of the number of people that were there and that she had to feed, and the fact that Mary wasn't helping her. She came to Jesus and said, Jesus, tell Mary to help me. And you remember what Jesus said to her, right? Martha, Martha, you worry about so many things, but only one thing is important. And Mary has, has, uh, is um, uh, seeking that. And so what we need to understand is that there's one thing that's important in life, and that is our relationship with God. And that's the most important thing. And that needs to be restored first before anything else can happen. And so that was being restored. And that's why David was coming in to bless his family. Now that relationship had been restored. But instead of being happy about the restoration of, the, of their spiritual relationship with God, she was concerned about how people saw it. She was concerned about that. And, you know, that kind of also reminds me of how it used to be at church. And maybe there's even some churches that still do this that on Sunday morning, everybody would wear their best clothes. And their the reasoning for doing it, they would say, is well, we want to offer God our best. But then if you had night service, most of them changed and didn't wear the same thing in the evening. And so you kind of wonder, well, do you only give God your best on Sunday morning? But really what it was it, it is from, from, for most people, it was they didn't want to look bad in the sight of other people. Uh, and, and that's why they wore their best. And so it used to be a show of who got the best clothes or at least who can look the nicest. Uh, and sometimes that's exactly what, what the, the morning church service was as you see people coming in instead of people being like David who came to worship God, really didn't matter what you were wearing, although you do want to be modest. And that's the reason I told you that when it says he was uncovered, he wasn't naked. He was still covered, but he wasn't covered with his royal clothing. He, he wasn't worshiping God as a king. He was worshiping God as a common person. And that's another thing we need to understand. When we come to church, we're not, um, you know, if, if you happen to be in political power, when you come to church, you're not a senator. You're not the president. You're, you're, you're not a congressman. Uh, you're, you're not a governor. When you come to church, you're a regular, normal person. And everybody who meets together when they do come to services is coming together on exactly the same basis. And that is that we're all in need of worshiping the God who loves us and who takes care of us and provides for us. And so we all act the same. And it doesn't matter whether you are a governor or a president or a multimillionaire of some company. When you come to services, we are all exactly the same and we're to treat each other exactly the same. And if we don't, it's because we like, like um, 
my kale are more worried about the physical things than we are about the spiritual things. And James was teaching us about that in James chapter two, when it talks about if a man comes in and has dirty clothes, do you put him in the back? But a man who comes in with, with rich clothes and with, the, with gold on his hands, do you put him up in the front? Uh, you know, he was talking about how, how is it that you treat people according to their physical, uh, uh, physical means. And that's what David is indicating here. David was going to worship God, not as a king, because as far as God's concerned, that doesn't mean a single thing that he's king, because God even made him king. God even gave him that position, just like God allows rich people to be rich and governors to be governors and kings to be kings. Uh, God allows those things, but that doesn't make them any more special, any more important. And so that's one of the things that we need to understand. So let me give you a couple of lessons that you, that you, you need to take out of here. If you come to church and you expect people to treat you different because you're a boss or an employer of some of the people that are there, you better change your attitude. Or if you come to church looking for uh, a nice building and for stained glass windows so that you can impress the people that you bring on how well your church, the, the church building looks or how educated your preacher is, you're probably coming for the wrong reason. If you're coming to church, if you're coming to church because you want to show to people how well you're dressed and how, how, how much God has given to you, then you're probably there for the wrong reason. We come, to, we come to services together as a group in order to encourage one another to, be, to serve God and be more like him. And, and we certainly praise God for all the blessings he gives us, but we don't come to show off our blessings or to indicate uh, how much we have and make other people feel bad because they might not have as much as we are, as we do. And that's one of the reasons why it was David who had riches and David was the one who distributed to those who didn't have as much. And so David is blessing the people with, with what he has. He's sharing what he has, but he's acting just like them. Uh, and that's the reason that he was wearing the same kind of things that they were wearing. But Michael was more worried about the physical things that that also we need to understand works about our house when we're when we're more concerned about whether our house is clean than whether we whether we are renewing our relationship with God at church and so so we'll stay home from church in order to clean our house or, or to wash our clothes uh, or whatever reason we might stay home uh, maybe we're more concerned about the physical things than we are about the spiritual things and don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you got to be at church all the time. That's not what I'm pointing out. I'm just pointing out our attitudes. Our actions indicate our attitude. See, she despised David in her heart, and that came out in her attitude. That came out in her actions. And so she was the one who said, how the king of Israel distinguished himself today and covered himself today in the eyes of the servants' maids as one of the foolish ones shamelessly uncovers himself. So that's what, that's what she said to David. Now, in verse 21, David says, so David said to Michael, it was before the Lord. Now, I want, you to, I want you to think of that right there. It was before the Lord. David is saying, I wasn't doing what I was doing for the sake of people seeing me. I wasn't doing what I was doing so I could, be, so I could uh, get recognition from the people. It's not why I was doing what I was doing. Now, if you remember the scribes and the Pharisees, they would take the things that God told them to do, and they would exaggerate those things in order to make themselves look better. That's why Jesus uh, told them in Matthew 24 that they broaden their phylacteries and, and enlarge the tassels of their garments. See, those were things that God had told them to do, but these individuals had taken them and made them uh, bigger and, and emphasized them so that they would look better than other people. And that's today when you have, when you go to to, to some churches and the people are wearing robes to, to distinguish them from other people. There, we are not to be distinguished from other people. We are to be exactly like the, same, like the people that we are serving because we are like that. And so we don't wear robes, we don't wear fancy name tags, we don't wear fancy titles, none of that stuff. And so I don't want you to think that that's just New Testament teaching, that's Old Testament teaching. Now the priests were to wear certain garments because those garments represented something to God, not to people. Today, what you, your outside garments represent nothing to God. G God doesn't care whether you have good clothes or bad clothes on. Uh, God only cares if the clothes you're wearing are modest clothes, the clothes that aren't attracting attention 
um, and that, that you don't put on for the purpose of attr attracting attention, which is the same reason why God says that the Pharisees and the scribes, they wear long robes so they can be seen by people and notice far away, oh, look, there, there comes a scribe, there comes a Pharisee. And so none of that is found here. And so there's a number of lessons that we can get out of here if, if we're just kind of spiritual minded. But Michael's problem was that she despised him in her heart as a result of that, as a result of that, uh, it had to come out. And so David, being a man of God, says it was before the Lord. God says, I'm not concerned about what people think. I'm not concerned about uh, what people say. Uh, it's interesting that that uh, I, I listened to various lessons on, online many times uh, in order to, to get uh, different perspectives or, or to listen, uh, besides reading the scriptures, which of course is first. Uh, and, and I remember listening to one guy, and, and he says that, that uh, he doesn't take uh, money from, quote, you know, a, a church because he doesn't want the church to tell him what he can and cannot preach. And I'm thinking, what in the world does that have to do with from who you take money from? Nobody tells you what to do. Nobody tells a, a person of God what to do. It doesn't matter where they get their money from. It, it, it doesn't matter if you're a plumber. It doesn't matter if, if you're a minister who is, who is supported by, by a church or whether you're you're, um, you know, just a, a regular school teacher. Uh, it doesn't matter who's paying you the money. Uh, you, our job is is not to is not to determine that we're going to do what people tell us to do because they pay us money. Our job is to do what we do for the Lord. And if the people who are paying us don't like it, so be it. And they can always not pay us. Uh, but just because you just because you happen to be somebody who's being supported by a church, which I believe uh, Jesus taught, because Paul said that a, a laborer is worthy of his hire, uh, that that activity is not going to keep you from doing what you're doing to the Lord. Like here, David, most of his support came from the people. Because remember when God set up the, when God said rulers and governors, he told Samuel that one of the things they're going to do is they're going to take 10% of, of your money, they're going to take your servants, they're going to take your slaves, they're going to take your property, they're going to take your food. So that's true of David too. Now, it, it might not be as much uh, true of David, but it's still true uh, for, for David that he's being supported by the country that he's, that he's serving. And, and, and yet David doesn't say, no, no, don't, you know, don't bring me anything because I, I'm afraid that you guys are going to tell me what to do. No, that was Saul's problem. And so that attitude isn't one of who supports you. That attitude is one of, am I going to serve the Lord no matter what? And it's like I've told people, I don't get paid to preach. I get paid because I preach. And anytime the church that I preach for uh, wants to cut off my, my income because I believe something that they don't want to support, then they have the right to do that. But I also know that God has taken care of me and will continue to take care of me. Uh, all my life. And so it, it, he did it before the Lord. And we need to remember that that's true of anything, not just getting paid, but it's true of how we raise our family, how, how we teach in our secular jobs, uh, how, we, how we work in our secular jobs. Uh, if, you're, if you're a teacher, uh, I know we're worried sometimes about our support because, you know, we can't teach certain things, but you're going to have to ask yourselves, am I doing this for the Lord or am I doing this for people? And so, and I'm not trying to judge anybody, but I know there's a lot of things that are being taught today that I personally couldn't teach. Uh, and, and therefore, I personally couldn't be a teacher. And I know that there's some individuals who uh, have quit teaching because of those things. Now, and don't again, don't misunderstand me. Uh, there are good Christian people that are teaching, and, and they have to work that out in their own minds as they're serving God. But my, my, my point is just real simple. What we do, we do before the Lord. And so David says, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all the house. So, so David says, I'm doing this before the Lord because the Lord's the one who chose me. Now, here's what I want us to understand. God chose us. In Ephesians chapter 2, he says God chose us. Now, he chose us in Christ, but he chose us. A and as he chose us, then we're doing what we're doing because he chose us, because he's the one who blessed us. He's the one who does these things for us. He's the one who's allowed me to work in a church for the number of years that I've worked in. He's the one that's done that. Uh, it, it's not me. He's the one that's given us, given us breath. 
and he's the one that gives you a house to work in. He's the one that gives you a job. He chose us. And therefore, since he chose us, we do things for him to glorify his name. And so, and so David reminds her that it's, it's God who chose David and chose David above her father and above all his house. See, God chose us before the, the leaders and the rulers of our land. In other words, by that I mean that God isn't saying, I'm choosing you because you are somebody so important that I'm choosing you. God chose us when we were nobodies. God chose us when we were enemies. And he, and he chose us just like he chose David when David was a, a sheep herder. God chose David and he chose David above, uh, above Michael's father, Saul, who had the same attitude that Michael had, which by the way is another lesson. And so David says to appoint me ruler over his people, Israel. So God chose David and appointed David ruler over Israel, not because David was so wonderful and so terrific, but because God said, I need him. And God chose him and over Israel, not just over Judah, but over Israel. And so since that's true, David says, therefore, I will celebrate before the Lord. So David is saying, I don't have to apologize to you for how the people see me. And I don't really care how the people see me. What I care about is how does God see me? And, and, and how does God view me? We're the ones who are concerned about how people look. We're the ones who are concerned about how much money people have. We're the ones that are concerned about, uh, about people's reputation. God's not. And so what we see here is David then uh, returning back to what you might say uh, is a regular normal person and worshiping and praising God and leaping and dancing like all the other normal people would do. And he does it in, he does it in front of God and, and he's doing it for God. And he's not overly concerned about what people think about what he's doing unless somehow that brings shame or reproach upon God. And that's when we should worry about what we do. Some of us should be, should be worried about the books that we read and the television shows that we watch and, and the, the music that we listen to um, in, instead of, uh, you know, whether I wear nice clothes to church or not. Uh, and, and that's what we should be concerned about. Now, verse 22, David points this out, however. He says, even though he is disrespected by his wife, who is, who is one of the queens, disrespected by her, he says, I will be more lightly esteemed than this and will be humble in my own eyes. But with the maids of whom you have spoken, with them I will be distinguished. In other words, what, what David says is that in my own eyes, he will even be more humble. He will, be, he will even be more lowly than he was. In other words, David's saying, in my own eyes, I don't see myself as this king, and so therefore I worship God as a king. David says, I humble myself. I'm a nobody as far as God's concerned. And he says, but with those maids whom you have spoken about, who you say are going to despise me, in actuality, they're the ones that I'm going to be distinguished in because they're going to, rec they're going to recognize David's humility, and they're going to recognize David's David's understanding that he's just another man and, uh, and another person just like them, and that's what's going to lift him up in their eyes because they're going to see David, and they're going to recognize David just sees himself as, a, as another person and doesn't see himself as so important because he's this king, and therefore they're going to, they're going to appreciate that. And, and also they're going to appreciate the fact that David is doing this because he's concerned about the, uh, his relationship with God and pleasing God and not how people are going to see him. And that's what we need to understand. Spiritual minded people are going to understand if your children don't go to the best college because you didn't spend a lot of time making a lot of money. So they go to the best colleges instead of teaching them the word of God and being, being in their lives and involved in their lives. They're not going to be overly concerned. The spiritual-minded people aren't going to be overly concerned with what college they came from as much as, as you having given up for them what was necessary for you to teach them about God, whether they go to college or not. But our culture is one where people are overly concerned about college and, and, and going to college and, and going to the best college, and so they're willing to spend a quarter of a million dollars 
to be educated so that they can supposedly get a better job than those who don't. And don't misunderstand me, I'm not complaining about college. I'm complaining about our attitude towards it and our understanding of education when it comes to uh, whether we're going to be successful in life or not. Uh, not all people have to go to college. Uh, there are many trade schools that, that are where people can make a whole lot more money, uh, but you don't get distinguished as much uh, as other people do. And so you, you might need to ask yourself why you're really doing the things that you're doing. Now, verse 23, it says, And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Now, there's two reasons why she might not have any children to the day of her death. One, because after she was despised by David, David didn't want anything to do with her. That's certainly possible. Or two, God closed up her womb. Either way, her activity led to the consequences of her relationship with her husband. Now, what's interesting is that there is a scripture that does tell us, however, that Michael raised children, but they weren't her children that she raised. Apparently, they were uh, children from a relative who uh, allowed Michael to raise them, but Michael herself had no, had no children till the day of her death. And in that day and time, having no children uh, was looked upon as a curse from God. And so our attitude is a thing that determines what we say. And in this case, you have the attitude of a princess uh, who looks at religion and, and at life as something that is to be, to be done by uh, nobility, and that no, nobility does differently than other people. And none of that is true. And so we need to make sure that we don't get into that idea. So as we get into chapter 7, we notice that in chapter 7, we're going to have David to have a covenant, make a covenant with God. Now, I'm not going to be able to get into a lot of this, and I want to spend some time with it. So we're just going to read a couple of the of first few verses, uh, and then I'll comment on those things. And then the next time we meet, we'll be able to have a good discussion on what's under consideration. Now, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Now, it came about when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest on every side, from all his enemies, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tent curtains. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your, that is in your mind, for the Lord is with you. But in the same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, and saying, Go and say to, the, to my servant David, Thus says the Lord, uh, Are you the one who should build me? A house to dwell in, for I, I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, even in a, uh, in a tabernacle. Wherever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, I want, to, I want to stop there at verse 7. And I want you to notice that what David does is David, like, like somebody who's con any person who's concerned about God, uh, is concerned many times about uh, the way people might see God. And certainly that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to think about, well, how, pe how are people going to see God? I mean, uh, after all, in, in our culture, if you drive around in a beat-up car, they think of you one way. If you drive around in a Rolls Royce, they think about you in a different way. And so here's David, and David is king. And it says in verse 1, that came about when, king, when the king lived in his house. Now, his house would be his palace. His palace is not just some little, you know, adobe hut that was set up. It, it's a nice house. Uh, it, and so David had this, this palace is what David had. And it says, and the Lord had given him rest on, on every side from all his enemies. And so David now wasn't overly concerned about securing the nation because God had secured the nation for him. And I think it's interesting that, that as, as we struggle in life, sometimes we have a better relationship with God than when we don't. Because when we struggle in life, 
then we're not overly concerned about, about trying to get everything right with God, you might say, but we're more concerned about, about God helping us in our, in our activities and the things that we need. Whereas when we see God not so much as needing to help us, then we start looking for, for ways in which we might express to God our, our blessings that he's given to us. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't really think there's anything wrong with that, but I think that's, that's interesting that that happens. That, and maybe that's where that saying came from, uh, idle hands are the devil's work. In other words, we're trying to find something to do with ourselves. Uh, and if you're somebody who loves God, then, and, and you have extra time, then you would probably want to do something for God and with God. And so that's what we have going on here. So uh, the, the Lord had given rest to David on every side. That's one of the things that David had done. And of course, we understand that this is speaking of in generic terms when it says, or general terms, when he says rest on every side, because certainly David still had enemies. But the idea is, is that the enemies were not out to get David at this, at this moment. God had put within their, their, the enemy's hearts a desire to leave David alone, uh, as, as you think about that, and as we, as we understand that. And so in, in um, First Chronicles account, in verse 1, it says, And it came about when David dwelt in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, Behold, I am dwelling in the house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under curtains. Then Nathan said to David, Do all that is in, that is in your heart, for God is with you. And he came about the same night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell David my servant thus. And so he's going to go, he's going to go talk to David. But, but notice that it says that in, in Chronicles, that it says there that, um, you know, David said he's dwelling in, in curtains, in a tent of curtains, verse 2 of 1 Samuel uh, 7, verse 2 says, And the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within tents within 10 curtains. In other words, David says, I have this permanent building, and yet God's house is still a tent, you know, and we understand the difference between a tent and a house, you know, even though some tents might be, might be wonderful and, and terrific, uh, you know, and, and made elegantly, we understand that there's a big difference between a tent and a house. A, a house is something more permanent, and it's a permanent structure. Whereas a tent is something movable and something that moves around. And so David is here in this permanent structure. And remember that, uh, you know, it seems that, you know, from first looking at it, it seemed that the reason why God built a tent when they wandered around in Israel was because they were going to wander around in Israel for 40 years. But here's what you need to remember. They weren't going to wander around in Israel, in, in, sorry, in the land of Canaan for 40 years. God was going to bring them into the land of Canaan immediately. You remember, that's that's what he did. So after they built the after they built the tabernacle, they didn't build the tabernacle after they sinned and were getting ready to walk in the wilderness for forty years. They built the tabernacle before that. They built the tabernacle before they even realized that they weren't going to get the promised land for another forty years. They built the tabernacle because that's what God wanted. That's the structure that God designed and that God. Uh, that God made them to build. It wasn't, it wasn't an afterthought that happened after uh, God said they're not going to go into the land of Canaan for, for 40 years. Now, you might be saying, well, God knows everything, and he knew that. Well, that's true. God does, but that's not why God gave them the, the tabernacle. God doesn't, God doesn't do, do things, you know, like uh, uh, give them... Um, rituals to do or activity to do because of what's going to happen in the future, God gives it to them so they learn something immediately about God. And so I'd suggest to you that that's the same thing that happened here, that when God built that tabernacle at the very first time, there was a message that God was trying to convey to Israel. There was a message. I'm going to notice what that message is here in just a minute. But what I want you to understand is that this tabernacle didn't come in as a result of them wandering in the wilderness. It came in as God gave them the law and God gave them the, the sacrificial system that God gave them. And so <clears throat> David says that God dwells in a tent, you know, with curtains. And it says, Nathan said to the king, go, do all that is in your mind for the Lord is with you. 
Now, let me suggest to you that when David, I'm sorry, when Nathan said this to David, Nathan isn't saying, this is what God told me. This is simply what Nathan says. Nathan, as a person, I would suggest to you, says this thing here. It's not, I'm speaking uh, as the prophet. You have to remember that the, that the only time the prophets were prophesying was when they had a message from God. Anytime they spoke that they didn't have a message from God, it wasn't from God, and it could be wrong. Uh, that's certainly what we see in the story of Balaam, the, uh, the prophet, you know, that, that prophet that wanted to curse God's people. And yet, when, every time God put a word in his mouth, it was to bless Israel. But then later on, we find out that uh, Balaam <clears throat> told Baruch to put stumbling blocks in, in Israel's way. Now, God never said that, even though Balaam the prophet said that. That wasn't something God said. So when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, that's when the thing has to come true. If it doesn't come true, then why in the world are we listening to God if he can't even keep his own word? So as Nathan is talking to, to King David here, <coughs> it doesn't seem that Nathan asked God about it. Nathan, just kind of understanding God's relationship with David, figured that God would be okay with it because God is pleased with the things that David does, and, and David is not, is not asking for something that's selfish or something that, that you know, is, is, does not seem uh, to glorify God. And so we can understand why Nathan would just simply say to King David, go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. And, but then we also see that God does come and talk to David, uh, to Nathan, who is the prophet who is the one whom, whom David should get his information from. And verse 4 says, But in the same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, And so the word of the Lord comes to Nathan because he's a prophet. And as Nathan is this prophet, that's where David should get his information from. And it says in verse 4, but in this uh, in verse 5, Go and say to David, my servant, thus says the Lord, Are you the one who should build a house, uh, me a house to dwell in? So uh, God says to Nathan, go tell David or ask David if he's the one who he thinks that should, should build me a house. And, and of course, the answer is, is he shouldn't, uh, or God's going to tell him he shouldn't. Now, now, verse 6 says, for I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel <clears throat> from Egypt, even to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. And so I'm going to stop here, but as we stop here, notice that God says, I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt. Now, what that means is, as soon as they entered the land of Canaan, and they had secured the land, if God wanted them to build him a, per, a, a, a permanent house, he would have told them. God, God was speaking through the prophets. God could have said, okay, <clears throat> now we have Israel, now we have the nation of God. And so now I need a permanent house. But God didn't do that. God was moving around in a tent. And I, I believe there's some, some reasons for that. And we'll get into those reasons next week. But I pray the Lord blesses you. I pray he keeps you. And I pray that you keep studying and learning and thinking about God every day of your life. And pray that God richly blesses you in all that you do. Thanks for being here.